would please turn over and mark in your songbook, song number 148. Song number 148. That will be our song of invitation after the lesson this morning, at which time we'll sing the first and second verse. past Lord's Day, I shared with you a lesson concerning the subject of baptism, and we learned why Baptist baptism is not scriptural during that lesson. Not that I have some axe to grind with our friends, the Baptists, and our loved ones in the Baptist church, but I thought it would be a good time at this point to continue our study on this subject and look a bit deeper at the historical view of Baptists on the subject of baptism. We know after various other studies that we've done that baptism is one of the things that we differ with our Baptist brethren or our Baptist friends and neighbors, not our brethren. But we realize that this is something that we will never come to unity on unless we are willing to study about these things open-mindedly and go to the Bible and clearly see what the Bible says about these things and take what the Bible says on the issue instead of trying to reason with man's reasoning from out of books that men have written in times past. So what I hope to convey in this lesson today is what we in Churches of Christ and those of our Baptist church friends uh, share, that we share some sound biblical reasoning on certain aspects of the subject of baptism, one of those being what is often called the mode of baptism. There is really no modes of baptism spoken about in the pages of the Bible. Baptism is an immersion, but those in the theological world speak of the modes as if there's different types of baptisms, being that of immersion, pouring, or sprinkling. And we've talked about that before, but the Bible does not use the word baptism in that way. And so we share a commonality with our Baptist friends and neighbors concerning what baptism really is, which is an immersion in water, but we differ over the reasons why a person is baptized. As of late, we've begun to hear more and more about what is called Reformed Baptist, and many of our, many of our Baptist friends are even starting to hear more and more about this terminology as well. It was, I was not much aware of this in our area of North Alabama until I was having a conversation with a co-worker a while back, and he began to talk about someone else that I worked with, uh, that we both worked with, who had been talking about Reformed Baptists. Of course, we've become more informed about the beliefs of the Reformed Baptists uh, through watching our videos and things that we have been uh, of the Robertsons and their work over in the Carolinas and in that area. And so, but we have noticed really that there's not that many people that we're aware of in this area that has those sort of views, but the Reformed Baptists, their history goes back quite a long ways. And from my understanding, the Reformed Baptists actually came into being around 1630. And so 1630 is quite a long ways back for these people to have existed. And so the, they consider themselves as being the true Baptist, the, and having the true Baptist theology and the true Baptist belief. And that is why you're starting to hear more and more about Reformed Baptists, even in the areas round about us. It's because they believe that they are, they actually hold the true Baptist doctrine. And as most of us know, there have been numerous splits in the so-called Baptist church that has existed for many years. There are an estimated 50 million Baptists in the world today, and yet they are not united as one people. And some estimate there are at least 211 sub-denominations within this one Protestant denomination of the Baptist church. One website I visited said that a primary Baptist principle is that the local Baptist churches are independent and self-governing. But this 
but they, of course, did not provide a biblical reason uh, for that's, this doesn't provide a biblical reason for their disunity because being self-governing doesn't give each of them the right to teach their own specific doctrine and then con uh, have what they call as being unity when that actually is disunity if they're teaching things different from one another. And so if this was really true and they actually had, uh, they actually were self-governing and united like the Bible talks about, they would not have a need for such things as the Southern Baptist Convention, which decides upon the doctrine that those who associate with the Southern Baptist Convention are to adhere to. Nor would you have the need for the existing of various other things like the Baptist associations that we see in the areas round about us that certain local congregations belong to. But of course, this is a subject that we could talk about in greater detail, and it's not the subject of our lesson this morning. But should one simply search the internet for the, re, uh, for the meaning of the phrase Reformed Baptist, one might read something like this. Reformed Baptist are Baptists that hold to a Calvinistic soteriology. Soteriology simply means a theological teaching about salvation, so they are Calvinistic in their meaning or understanding of the Bible. In other words, they follow after all five tenets of Calvinism. It goes on to say they can retrace their history through the, form, through, uh, the early modern particular Baptists of England. The first Reformed Baptist church was formed in the 1630s, the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith was written along Reform Baptist lines. So right here is a copy of the Reformed, the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. I purchased this some time back in order to have a copy of this and get more familiar with exactly what they teach. So as I've mentioned before, most of our Baptist friends that I'm acquainted with hold only to a certain number of the five main tenets of Calvinism, which we know are often uh, presented as the acrostic tulip. T-U-L-I-P, all of these things representing one particular tenet of Calvinism. But those of the Reformed Baptists hold to all five of these tenets and are most unapologetic for doing so and do not agree with their other Baptist associates who do not hold to all five tenets of Calvinism. So as I said some time ago, I, when I started hearing about the so-called Reformed Baptists, I got my own copy of this confession, and our Baptist friends that we have talked about this morning mentions this book, of course, in the Wikipedia uh, paragraph that I read just a few minutes ago. But it's on page 114 of this book that we read the following concerning baptism. And just so it's not second, uh, it's not considered coming from a second source, I will turn over to page uh, 114 in the book here and read the paragraph that we're going to be looking at a little bit closer this morning. It says here at the top under the heading of baptism, chapter 29, Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection of his being engrafted into him of remission of sins and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. And then they give six scriptural references inside that paragraph. Romans 6, 3 through 5, Colossians 2, verse 12, Galatians 3, 27, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, Acts 22 and verse 16, and Romans 6 and verse 4. And so... What I want us to do this morning, and I want everyone who has an opportunity to listen to this lesson, hopefully, to do exactly what we're going to do this morning. Instead of just accepting what the writers of 
these mere men who wrote this particular confession wrote concerning their own beliefs and understandings about the subject of baptism. I want us to notice in detail what they taught about the subject and then compare what they taught about the subject to what the Bible really says. And the best way to do this, I think, is to just simply examine what they've said in this one paragraph that I've read this morning and then go to the scriptures that they've quoted there and see what those scriptures really say. <coughs> First of all, we'll notice, and I'm sure most of us notice this too, that these men called baptism an ordinance. However, according to what they actually teach, they should have used the language of their Catholic counterparts and said it was a sacrament instead of an ordinance. I say this because the word ordinance means what one really thinks it would mean considering how it is spelled. Think about it. Ordinance. The first part of that word is order. So if they think that it's an ordinance... That means it's an order from somebody. Somebody has ordered it. But they don't believe that it is an order from somebody. They believe that it is a sacrament, which is a ceremony, a rite that a Christian goes through after having obeyed the order of having faith. You see, faith is something that is an ordinance in their mind because faith is commanded. But baptism is not commanded. Baptism, they say, is a sign. So a sign is simply a sacrament or a rite, a ceremony that they go through. You see the difference in their language? They say that they think it's an ordinance. But really, they're just exactly like their uh, Catholic counterparts in their understanding of what the word sacrament is. And we'll look at this a lot more in detail as we go on. Our, Bap our Baptist friends do not believe that baptism is a command, but instead they believe it is a sacramental rite. And that is what some, uh, when you have a sacramental rite, that is something that gives the person an option of doing something if they want to, not because they have to, because it's been ordered. And we can know that is what they believe by looking at what they continue to say in the remainder of the brief paragraph that we read there. They continue by stating, after they say it's an ordinance, that baptism is a sign. A sign of fellowship and a sign of being engrafted into him. But is that what the Bible really says? We know that our, our Baptist friends, what they mean typically when they use the word sign, because that is something we hear them say quite often in regard to baptism. When they use the word sign, they mean an outward show of something that has already taken place. So they teach that baptism is an outward show of a bond, a fellowship that has already taken place in the past action of somebody now being baptized, and that this same baptism is an outward show of one having already been engrafted into Jesus Christ prior to their baptism. The Baptists teach that fellowship with Christ takes place at faith. But fellowship with the church, being the Baptist church, does not take place until one is voted on and receives Baptist baptism. This is made much more clear in their standard manual for Baptist churches on page 22, where we read this. It says, the churches therefore have candidates come before them make their statement, give their experience, and then their reception is decided on by a vote of the members. And while they cannot become members without baptism, yet it is the vote of the body which admits them to its fellowship on receiving baptism. And this comes from the Standard Manual for Baptist Churches on page 22 a book which I also have a copy of, so I'm not quoting from second-hand sources. And so we can see plainly what the Baptist, even the Reformed Baptist, understand about baptism being a so-called sign and when fellowship actually takes place in their teachings and when fellowship does not take place and who this fellowship is with. 
At this point in the lesson, it becomes most necessary to notice in much greater detail the scriptural references now that is given for their beliefs, as we read earlier in the paragraph from the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. As I said, that was six uh, different scriptural references that were given there. Romans 6, 3 through 5, Colossians 2, verse 12, Galatians 3, 27, Mark 1, 4, Acts 22, 16, and Romans 6, 4. And so since we have two of these verses, uh, two of these scriptural references that concern Romans chapter 6, we'll just simply go to Romans chapter 6 first and examine what Romans chapter 6, the first few verses in there, what it really says, and if it says what the Baptists teach that it says inside these man-made manuals that we're reading about here. So instead of just uh, simply taking one or two verses completely out of context, let us look at these verses in their context and notice exactly what is being discussed about the subject of baptism. First, let us notice the, these three verses that they quote from Romans chapter 6. We'll start at verse 1, and we'll keep all these verses in its context. Starting at verse 1 of Romans chapter 6, this is what we read. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. That's the first seven verses of Romans chapter 6. The first thing I want to bring to your attention about the verses just read is that these Reformed Baptists who penned the writing of the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith reference these verses just read as being baptism in water. But how many of us have heard other Baptists say, no, this is not baptism in water, this is baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is the argument. That is what has changed between the Reformed Baptists and the Baptists that we see in our area mostly nowadays. For years we've debated with the Baptist people about what the meaning of baptism is. And when we get to these verses here, the Reformed Baptists believe that they're, it's baptism in water. They also believe that all the verses that we reference there, and yet some of y'all probably noticed that many of those verses are verses that we would often go to to prove baptism in water. But a lot of the Baptists in our area around here, and a lot of Baptists in other areas, have begun to say, no, this is not baptism in water. This is baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptism is being talked about here in these verses. And so that is something that we should notice right off the bat. The Reformed Baptists believe that these verses are talking about water baptism. So this is something that is very noteworthy should you ever have a conversation with a Reformed Baptist. Because most Baptists usually try to teach these verses and others are speaking about baptism in the Holy Spirit. In fact, out of coincidence, I'm sure Brother Pat Donahue noted this in an article just this week that he posted on Facebook. It was an article stating that, uh, stating that most believe that this is baptism in the Holy Spirit instead of baptism in water. But we know that our Reformed Baptist friends do not. And so, next we want to notice that these words we've just read were written to those, of course, who were already Christians. 
those who were members of the Lord's church in the ancient city of Rome. We know this because the Apostle Paul addresses the entire epistle to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Romans 1 and verse 7. From Romans 6 verse 1, we notice that the topic under discussion is twofold. Paul is talking about sin and he's talking about God's grace or unmerited favor. It is apparent from the first verse that some of these Christians had a misunderstanding about how God's grace works. That it was something that he continually bestows upon people every time they choose to sin, even after becoming a Christian. Paul clears this up by stating simply that this is not how God's grace works in salvation. Therefore, he tells them in Romans 6 verse 2, through a rhetorical question, that those who have died to sin in the act of water baptism should no longer live in sin any longer. Now notice it is immediately after this, you might say, well, he didn't say that they died to sin in the waters of baptism in that particular verse. Well, notice what he says in the very next verse. Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So say, I'm not assuming anything there. He goes on to say that very thing. Water baptism, when water baptism takes place, we are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ and we die from our sins at that point. This specifically tells us plainly that we die from our sins in our obedience to water baptism, and that we are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ by our obedience to water baptism. It should tell everyone this, but unfortunately man-made doctrines has mu have muddied up the understanding of these plain verses. But that's something if we simply take the Bible for what it says and forget what the man-made books say, it should be easy for us to understand this plain, clear, simple language. I'm not having to go to the Greek for anything here. This is all simple English. We can all understand exactly what this says. As we continue to look at these verses, the Apostle Paul continues by stating that in our obedience to this baptism, water baptism, one is buried with him through baptism into death. Romans 6 verse 3. The death of what? Well, of course, it is the death of sin. And yet our Baptist friends and loved ones are taught that they died to sin before their baptism. That they died to sin at the point of faith. But this says that you die to sin whenever you obey Christ in water baptism. It says it plainly. Now, when we realize this, can you see the importance of studying with our Baptist friends and neighbors about the subject of baptism? You see, they believe they died to sins at the point of faith and that their baptism was nothing but a sign or a symbol of something that had already happened. Our Baptist friends and neighbors have never been, have never died from sin. Because they were never buried with Christ for the remission of sins where that death takes place. They've never received death of their sins. And they've never been resurrected to newness of life. Because they have not done what Paul says these Romans had done. But let's go on and look at these scriptures a little bit more. Our Baptist friends and loved ones, of course, have been taught that they received newness of life, as I said, at the moment of some sort of spiritual experience that somehow enabled them to have faith. Though Paul said that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10 and verse 17, so I'm not sure where the experience that they talk about comes from. They just somehow insert that in there. Paul said that newness of life does not begin 
until one has died to sin. And he says that dying to sin, of course, takes place in our obedience to water baptism. As we continue to look at the rest of these verses, one must really be desperate, I think, to try to teach that these verses somehow refer to baptism in the Holy Spirit. After asking the question, just, just ask in verse 3, which was, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Paul describes what takes place in this particular baptism that he's talking about. Now listen to the description and honestly ask yourself if this describes what the Bible calls Holy Spirit baptism or water baptism. He says in Romans 6 verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In the New Testament, we have only two written accounts of Holy Spirit baptism ever having taken place. The first being that of the apostles as recorded at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, and the second being the household of Cornelius as recorded in Acts chapter 10. When we look at those accounts just briefly, we can see some noticeable differences between Holy Spirit baptism and water baptism. First of all, Holy Spirit baptism was a gift to be given. And not only that, it was a gift given in regard to an Old Testament prophecy to a select few. The giver of the gift was God, Acts 11 and verse 16. This gift was one that fell upon those who received it to the extent that they were said to be filled with the Holy Spirit, being the power of the Holy Spirit, and of course not the Holy Spirit himself, else you would have deity indwelling human flesh as of Christ. This gift enabled the recipients the ability to speak in languages other than their own native languages, and languages which they had not been previously taught such as we read about the apostles in Acts chapter 2. They were Galileans, the verses tell us. But then they, after being baptized with the Holy Spirit, spoke in Parthian, the language of the Medes, the Elamites, the Mesopotamians, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, the Jews, the Cretans, and the Arabs. And then we also learn that this gift was something that not only occurred, as far as the Bible tells us, on two different occasions, but it occurred for two very special reasons. The baptism of the apostles began the beginning, or it was at the beginning of the Lord's church, and it was for the purpose of convincing unbelieving Jews. The granting of repentance unto life was the purpose of of that which was done to the household of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. We learn that in Acts chapter 11 verse 18. The household of Cornelius received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for repentance unto life and to know that the Gentiles had been accepted into the kingdom with the Jews. So two very special reasons for the giving of the Holy Spirit at those times, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, two very different reasons in one respect. But they all had basically the same abilities on those occasions that we read about. In the first case, the recipients were the apostles who had already obeyed the command to be baptized in water for the remission of sins as per the teachings of John and Christ prior to the coming of the kingdom in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. And the second being the household of Cornelius that were all commanded to be baptized for the remission of sins after having received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this, of course, was to convince the, the unbelieving Jews of the Gentiles' acceptance into the kingdom. When Peter gave an account of the, this Holy Spirit baptism that took place 
in Cornelius' house before the church in Jerusalem later in Acts chapter 11, he states again that this was something that had only occurred with Cornelius and his household, and it was something that had only occurred one time before, and he said that was as upon us at the beginning, referring to when it happened in the book of Acts in the city of Jerusalem with the apostles. But now, after noticing what the gift of the Holy Spirit consisted of, let's look back again at the baptism that Paul was talking about. Paul is discussing in Romans chapter 6, he describes it, when we describe it in comparison to what we've just noticed about Holy Spirit baptism, we notice in Romans 6 verse 4 that Paul describes this baptism as a burial of a person willing to obey the one who has commanded the baptism. Not something that falls upon someone and then fills them. So see, there's a difference between these two baptisms. Holy Spirit baptism falls and then fills. But water baptism is a burial. Secondly, we notice that this baptism that Paul speaks about is also one that had a different purpose. Being that of passing from a life of worldliness and sin into death of sin, Romans 6 verse 2, just as Christ was raised from the dead, and not that of enabling the recipients to speak in languages, unlearned in order to convince someone else of the truth. And so you see there was different purposes for the baptism, different results of the baptism that resulted in the different purposes. Thirdly, Romans 6, verse 5 through 7 continues by stating that the baptism that Paul is discussing is one that unites us together in the likeness of Christ's death in order that we can also be in the likeness of his resurrection and tells us that during this baptism our old man is crucified, that the old body of sin is done away with, and that we are no longer slaves to sin afterward because we've been freed from sin. None of that is ever said about Holy Spirit baptism. Holy Spirit baptism had nothing to do at all with forgiveness of sin. Now, dear listeners, does the baptism thus described by the Apostle Paul sound anything like the one described by Peter as he described that of Holy Spirit baptism? Everyone should certainly see that it does not. They're two completely separate baptisms. As we turn back to the list of scripture references found in the Baptist Confession of Faith 1689, we come to the verse of Colossians 2 verse 12, which again I find to be a very difficult verse for our Reformed Baptist friends to try to use to prove that water baptism is merely some sort of sign. Notice what Paul, how Paul describes water baptism in Colossians 2, verse 11 through 14, and see if this sounds like a sign of something that's already taken place. Starting at verse 11, he says, In him you were also circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and having the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And so when we look at these verses right here, we see the purpose of this baptism was exactly the same as the one being talked about in Romans 6. This has nothing to do 
with a sign of something that's already taken place, this is the act in which it takes place. If baptism, if water baptism is simply an outward sign of salvation that has already taken place in the life of a Reformed Baptist, a Baptist which is baptism which is not, they say, really necessary for salvation at all, but merely something required by a local Baptist church to be part of their fellowship, that person has been saved without receiving, without receiving, the circumcision made with hands, described as the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which takes place at the point of being buried with him in baptism, and then being raised with him through faith in the working of God. That's what these verses say happens in this baptism. It doesn't happen during some experience that you had prior to doing this, it happens in this act. It is clear that it does. It's clear in Romans 6 that it does as well. So our Baptist friends are trying to tell us that one can be saved and yet still have our body of sin of the flesh. Because these verses say that body of sin is not cut off until we have water, we, we've obeyed the command to be water baptized. That is when that body of sin gets cut, cut off. That is when that circumcision takes place, is during water baptism. So if we're saved before that, that means that we are saved and we still have the body of sin. And it's yet to be cut off. It's spiritually circumcised. If we go on and look at the rest of that verse, it would also mean that we are saved without being forgiven of all trespasses. Because that's what it says that act does. It forgives us of all trespasses. Colossians 2 verse 13. And it would also find us still dead in sins. Because the dying state we have not yet been made alive together with him, having died to sin. We would still be dead in our sins, still be guilty of our sins, still be in the body of sin, and still be guilty of all of our trespasses if we were saved before we were baptized. Hopefully we can see what a mess we can get himself into when we listen to men and say to God. As we go on to look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, we'll also look at verse uh, 27. Well, we'll look at verses 26 through 29, actually, and get the whole context of this as well. And I find this, again, an unfortunate verse for our Reformed Baptists to use to try to prove that baptism is just a sign. Let's notice what these verses say. Starting at verse 26 of Galatians 3. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus have put on Christ. Do you realize what those two verses right there say? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. The Baptist would stop right there and say, See, we're sons of God at faith in, when we have faith in Christ. But he goes on and gives the reason. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been on Christ. That was part of the faith. That's what the word for means. This is the reason for that. He goes on to say, For as many as you, as were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. For if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
So here we read that our obedience to water baptism places us into Christ. So if water baptism places us into Christ, then prior to water baptism, where are we? We're outside of Christ. The Reformed Baptists and most all other Baptists say that we're saved at the point of faith. They believe that we're in Christ at the point of faith. But baptism is what puts us into Christ. If we're saved before baptism, we are not into Christ. We are out of Christ. But notice also what it says in these verses. If language means anything, it would mean also that one can be saved outside of Christ. It also goes on to say that we are baptized into Christ and this happens during water baptism. It also would go on to mean that we are still slaves to sin. Because we have not been freed from our sin. It would also mean that we are not part of Abraham's seed. Because if we become part of Abraham's seed during the act of water baptism, then we are not part of it until we do that. And it also says we are heirs according to the promise. It says we are Christ's at the point of water baptism. So what does that mean? Where does that mean that we are before water baptism? If we're not Christ until we're water baptized, that means our Baptist friends have us saved and we don't belong to Christ. We're not Christ's because this verse says you become Christ's. You belong to Christ whenever you have obeyed the command to be water baptized. When we look at Mark 1 verse 4, I'm not quite sure why they even included this in their book. Because every one of us knows that this took place during the lifetime of Jesus Christ. This is in reference to John's baptism. And John's baptism was for the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But who was John's baptism for? Was it for Christians in the New Testament age? Or was it for backslidden Jews in preparation for the kingdom and coming of Christ? So I won't even go into detail trying to explain because I don't really know why they even put that verse in there. But the next verse they mention and the last one that they mention is Acts 22 and verse 16. And all of us are familiar with this because this concerns the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, being Paul the Apostle. When we look at just that one verse, and the only verse they offer is Acts 22 and verse 16, this one verse they try to use to prove that water baptism is just a sign of salvation. But this one verse says that the act of obedience to water baptism washes away our sins. So if our sins are not washed away until after we're water baptized, what does that mean our state of spiritual being is before we're water baptized? means we're still guilty of our sins, doesn't it? If they're not washed away until, until you are water baptized, in other words, let's look at it this way. You've got, in the Baptist mind, you've got an experience that's going to happen. God is going to come down and miraculously change your heart from an evil heart into a believing and faithful heart. He's going to give you the ability to believe. And then you're going to have to go before a Baptist church and you're going to have to tell them about your experience. They're going to have to vote on you and they're going to have to say, okay, he's a candidate to be baptized. But that baptism means absolutely nothing except you're a member now of this local Baptist church. 
after everything that we've read about water baptism, what it does, it's over here, and they've got salvation over here. Long before you get to over here, even if it was separated by one second, it would be too long. They have salvation here, but the Bible has it at water baptism. Everything they say about their so-called experience, whatever that is, happens during water baptism, according to the very verses that they themselves give in their books. So in closing, when one hears the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and becomes a believer in Him as the only begotten Son of God, they are moved by that message to repent of their past sins, confess their newfound faith in Jesus Christ before witnesses, and obey His command to be baptized for the remission of their past sins. That is the New Testament plan of salvation. What my Baptist friends and loved ones must prove to me, and they must be willing to do this if they think that I'm wrong, and think that members of the churches of Christ are wrong on this, they need to defend their teaching. And they need to be able to show us from the Bible these things. Number one, when they tell us that this is just a sign, water baptism is just a sign of something that's already taken place, the Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us that we die to sin in water baptism, Romans 6 verse 2. It says we are baptized into the death of Christ in water baptism, Romans 6, verse 3. It says we are then raised from the death of sin into newness of life in water baptism, water, Romans 6, verse 4. It says we are united with Christ in death, Romans 6, verse 5, in water baptism. It says our old man of sin has been crucified, Romans 6, verse 6, in water baptism. It says the old body of sin has been done away with, Romans 6, verse 6, in water baptism. It says we are no longer slaves to sin because we've been freed from sin, Romans 6, verse 7, in water baptism. It says the old body of sin is circumcised, Colossians 2, verse 11, in water baptism. We are made alive again because our trespasses have been forgiven in water baptism. Colossians 2, verse 12. It says we are made sons of God at that point. Galatians 3, verse 26, in water baptism. And it also says we are made one in Christ in water baptism. We are made joint heirs with Christ and are Abraham's seed when we obey the command to be water baptized for the remission of sins. Galatians 3.29 And our sins are washed away in water baptism. Acts 22 and verse 16. I've just taken every verse that they use to prove that water baptism is a sign and showed you from the Bible that water baptism is necessary for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation. And for every one of these points right here that is made concerning our obedience to water baptism. This is the reason why discussing things like this with our Baptist friends and neighbors are so very necessary. They have been taught something by a man that does not coincide with what the Bible says about the same subject. Are we going to be brave enough to tell them and show them you've been taught incorrectly? And if you haven't been taught incorrectly, I have, and you need to teach me correctly. I'm open-minded. 
I want to study with people. But I've studied the Bible, and I've studied their writings too. And I believe that the Bible is right. And I believe that my understanding of the Bible is right because I'm taking the Bible simply for what it says. I'm not trying to read into into it something that coincides and makes it somehow merge with something I've been taught in the past by somebody else. I'm simply taking the Bible for what it says. And we're encouraging all of our Baptist friends and neighbors, as well as all of our denominational neighbors, to do this very thing. This is something that we in Churches of Christ take very seriously, not because we're agitators and want to try to cause trouble in the world with people. We are looking out way past all the trouble here on this earth to a time in the future known as eternity. And we are wanting all to be prepared for that time. And that time will come upon us in the blink of an eye. And if we are not prepared for it, the Bible tells us exactly what the unprepared people in Christ's day, how they described them, like the ones at the wedding feast, the ones who didn't have oil for their lamps. They were going to get oil for their lamps. And that's when the master of the house came and welcomed the prepared ones in. When the ones who were not prepared got back, they knocked on the door and he said he didn't know. We don't want any of our loved ones to be in that situation. We don't want any of our friends to be in that situation. We don't want anybody to be in that situation. We shouldn't feel toward even our greatest enemy a hatred that would want them to be found in that situation. We should be out, and every single Christian should be out trying to share this message with other people and trying to do our very best to convince them to study their Bibles and to examine the things that they've been taught and to make corrections in their life if they see that they need them. That's what we've done. We've all done that, and we continue to study and try to correct our lives if there's things that we misunderstand. That's what we've all got to do. We've all got to be honest with ourselves and honest especially with the word of God. Whatever your needs may be in response to the gospel, we pray that you'd make those needs known. If you as an erring Christian have fallen away in some respect publicly and need to repent of those things publicly, we give you that opportunity to this morning. If you need to respond to the gospel in any way, we pray that you'd make your needs known as we sing the invitation song.